real Christianity is offensive to people. Uh, I'm, I say real Christianity. There are Christianity that are not offensive to people, and that is not real. What do I mean by real Christianity? Is the kind of Christianity that is described in the Bible. If you live out your life as a Christian, according to the scripture, your life will be offensive to many people who don't believe in the Bible. Your friends and your colleagues, they, they don't mind you being a spiritual person, a religious person. They don't mind you that. Uh, in fact, they don't mind you if you're a Christian. In fact, we're living in this age, in this culture where spirituality is embraced. You look around you, whether they, they, they go to church or not, uh, whether they believe in a particular religion or not, my guess is a lot of your friends, your colleagues, they are quote-unquote spiritual. We're living in that age, like, you know, spirituality is, is a big thing. It's acceptable in our society. And... But what kind of spirituality? Not the kind of spirituality that the Bible talks about. That's what our culture, what our society believes in. Um, because real Christianity is offensive to them. Uh, the, the kind that is acceptable is this kind. The kind that says all roads lead to Rome. That kind of spirituality is acceptable. Um, another kind of spirituality that is acceptable is this. You can believe whatever you want, spirituality, as long as you don't tell me what to believe, kind of spirituality. See, that, that is not in the Bible. The Bible says, if you believe in me, then your job is now, as a disciple of Christ, is to make disciples of your friends, of your family. That means you have to not only tell them, you have to convince them, you have to disciple them and lead them up. That kind of spirituality is offensive. Because our day to day, our culture says, I believe in spirituality. Just don't tell me what to believe. I believe what I want to believe. You can believe what you want to believe. And also they say all roads lead to Rome. Another one is this. The kind of spiritual, spirituality that's acceptable in our society today is this. Spirituality, that is to help you be a better person. You're so stressed Maybe you need to, you know, retreat and seek divine guide, guidance. You look so terrible. Maybe you need to burn some incense or something. There are so many things people now do, use spirituality for personal betterment or enhancement. That's not the kind of spirituality that the Bible talks about. So other religions say, in, in other words, other religion and other spirituality says this. It is optional to embrace this kind of spirituality. It is optional and it is only for your good. It's to enhance, to make your life better. They say, follow our teachings, follow our rules, follow our guide, uh, follow our guru um, if you want to have a better life. If you want to have a peaceful life, if you want to have a stress-free life, that's, that's kind of spirituality is acceptable, and it's everywhere. Even non-religious people believe that kind of spirituality. However, Christianity says this in our passage today, that to be a Christian means you believe that you were once dead. You were once dead. If you're not Christian, the Bible says you're dead. And to, to many people, that's offensive because you're telling your friends who don't believe in Jesus, who don't put their faith in Jesus, that they're dead. That is offensive to a lot of people today. And that's the kind of Christianity that the Bible talks about, what Christianity is about. It's not optional. It's not life-enhancing rituals. It's not a thing to be Christian is to make your life better. It's not. The, Paul says if you're not a Christian, if you don't believe in Jesus, 
you are dead. So after Paul laid the foundations um, about Christians' identity in chapter 1, Ephesians 1, now he began to explain the reason why Christian identity is not only crucial, not only important, it's a matter of life and death. Do you see this? It, it, if you're a Christian, to believe in Jesus, you know this is life and death. It's not like, yeah, it's nice to do. It's, it's something that it's, you know, I, I got free time on Sunday. It's my life feels a bit better. Now I've got more friends that I'm a Christian. No, Paul says it's life and death. It's not optional. Um, so to be a Christian is, is not some kind of life enhancer uh, or, or a life booster, boost your morale, your confidence. It's not. Uh, it's not some kind of uh, mantra that say, you know, come if you can. Uh, if you can, it's fine. Uh, it's good if you are a Christian. If you're not, no big deal. No, that's not what the Bible says. That's not how the Bible describes Christianity. Christianity in the Bible says, if you're not Christian, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're dead. Do you believe in that kind of Christianity? Or Christianity is, you know, make, make your life better, enhance your life, give you self-confidence. Is that the kind of Christianity that you believe in? Quote, and quote, really, it's not just Christianity. Christianity is just one type of spirituality or religion that you chose because you happen to be in Australia, it's a Christian nation. But, you know, if, if you're in another nation that is, you know, say, a Muslim country, yeah, I can be a Muslim. It's just another kind of spirituality that makes me a better person. What kind of Christianity do you believe in? Is this the dead or alive kind of Christianity? Or is it's an optional thing? So today we're going to talk about this in three sections. The first one is, you were dead. I'm going to talk about that. Paul says, you were dead. And the second thing is, what killed you? Why you were dead? And finally, we're going to look at the bright side. You are made alive in Christ. You were dead, what killed you, and you are made alive. Three things. All those three things is in that passage, verse 1 to 10, chapter 2. So you were dead. Paul didn't say you are sick, that you need help. The Apostle Paul said you were dead. If you are sick, you can help yourself. Sick people can help themselves. They can seek help. They can get better. They go see a doctor, take medication, they get better. Or they can, they can Google it up. Some people don't trust doctor, you see. They Google it up. Some people go to doctor and come home and Google it up. Say, I'll just trust Google. Right? Uh, some people just go to chemists and just say, I need this. Right? And medicate themselves. You can do that. Or you can just rest. Some people don't even trust medication. They say, I, I just need to rest. They rest. Do whatever you need to do. If you're sick, you can get well. But that's not what Paul says, our condition, apart from Christ. That we're dead, we're not sick, we're dead. Let's, let's read that, verse 1 to 3 again. This is beautiful, to describe who we were before you became a Christian. If you're not a Christian, this is your life. Quote-unquote life, because Paul said you're dead. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walk, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Everyone, the rest of mankind, everyone, you were once dead. That's what Paul says. If you're not a Christian, you're not sick, you're dead. Uh, if you are not a Christian, you are not dying, but you're dead. See, one thing about dead people is, what? They don't know they're dead because they're dead. See, why your friends, your colleagues, your family who are 
not Christian, who don't believe in Jesus, don't know that they're dead. Why are they so arrogant in their deadness? Because they're dead. It is your job as someone who is alive to help someone who cannot see, cannot breathe, cannot hear, cannot feel anything. You, you say to me, well, I, I'm not a Christian. Uh, I'm not dead. Well, you're right if you look at your external life, if you look at the, the uh, physical dimension, the external and physical dimension of your life. Yes, you may seem alive, but that's only one dimension of life that will pass once you die physically. But there's a deeper dimension of life that only our spirit can feel that will live on forever for eternity long. Now, let, let me try to explain this, how, how you can say, if you're not Christian, say, I'm, I'm alive, I'm not dead. Um, a couple of years ago, my youngest son, he's, he's an entrepreneur at heart, um, he bought a couple of plants, chili plants from Bunnings with the goal of growing them and selling them back to the parents, to me and Poppy, right? So he used his pocket money, money that he saved up, buy a couple of chili plants from Bunnings and selling them to us, right? And so that was a couple of years ago. He planted them. He, he did well. He harvested a few times, right? But then, like children, they, they grow bored, right? And um, they grew bored of it. And um, last winter, he didn't look after it, and, and it did. It died. The, both of them died, like, you know, dried up, no leaves left. You know, uh, you, can, you, can, you, can, um, you can feel that the, the branches are all dried up and, like, just crack. It's like no life whatsoever. So he's been... He's been uh, neglecting them, not looking after them. And so we, we thought, we, I thought, it's, it's dead, just, you know, there's, there's no hope, right? But he was quite diligent, actually. So during, since a few months ago, he started, he changing the soil, he changed the soil, he started putting fertilizer, start watering them again. These two are two dead chili plants that he invests in. And uh, yesterday when I did gardening, I start seeing leaves from both plants, little leaves, lots of them. He, it seemingly, he brought them back to life. But the reality is this. He didn't perform miracles. It just looked dead. But it's still alive on the inside. That's the plant. So the plant may look dead externally, but it's actually still alive. Uh, internally, on the inside. Otherwise, whatever, how hard he try, he cannot possibly bring it back to life. See, your life, on the other hand, is quite the opposite to that plant, to that chili plant. If you're not in Christ, you may seem on the outside, externally, that you are alive, but you're dead on the inside. That's what the Bible says. And a spiritually dead person cannot help himself or herself. See, some people think that if you're not in Christ, you can help yourself to be safe. Even Christians who have been saved still try hard to help themselves to be even more safe. And that is not possible. That is just not possible. A spiritually dead person Hopefully now you can connect why Paul says you were dead. He's not talking about your physical presence or dimension that you're breathing right now. No, he's talking about your spirituality. In your spirit, you're dead. If you're dead, you cannot seek help. You don't see that you need help. You cannot research about it. You cannot Google about it. You don't want to Google about it. You cannot make yourself well if you're dead. So this, what makes even this passage here seemingly bad news, a good news. How can this become a good news when, when Paul says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins? Well, 
This is good news because imagine you have cancer growing inside of you and not knowing it. Don't you want to know that there's cancer inside of you? Or is it, pff, no, I'd rather not know. I, it could be growing inside, but I don't want to know. Do you think just because you don't want to know, cancer will not kill you? Of course not. It will kill you. See, there are people who refuse to find out the reality of their life because they don't want to face it. Um, especially older people generally. I don't know young people, but in my experience, older people, they say, I'm old, I'd rather not know. Like doing health checkup and all those stuff. So like, if I don't know, then they, they think they're healthy. I said, don't you want to know? At least you can try and live a better life and eat better and, and try to fix it. See, if you have cancer growing inside of you, if you want to get well, first you need to diagnose it. You need to know it, you see? And that's what Paul is trying to help us here. It looks like it's a bad news that you were dead, but he's trying to give us the good news, to tell us you are dead so we know that we need help, that we know that we are dead. He's telling us our condition. That's how he's helping us, by saying that you're dead. So this is what he's doing. If you're not in Christ, if you, don't, you have not put your faith in Jesus, you're dead. You're dead spiritually. You're dead on the inside. Um, and if you don't deal with it, you will dead phys- you'll be dead physically as well for eternity. So Christianity, the first point is this, that you're dead. Christianity is not a religion or spirituality practices that try to enhance your life, to make your life better, to make someone who is sick to become well. No, no, that's not Christianity. Christianity is in the business of making dead people alive. That's what Christianity is about. Not to make sick people better, no, but to make dead people alive. That's what Christianity is about. So... Christianity, in a sense, it's bold, it's exclusive as well. Yes, if, you're, if people reject Christianity, they say, well, you know, I can't accept Christianity because it's so exclusive. Well, anything real, anything genuine has to be exclusive in, a, in, in some way or another. And Christianity is exclusive in its claim. It's exclusive in that without exception, everyone is dead apart from Jesus. The Bible said there's no other way. If you're not in Christ, you're dead. There's just no other way. Not all roads lead to Rome. Only Jesus lead to the Father. Now, if you believe in that kind of orthodoxy, that kind of Christianity, biblical Christianity, then your life will be offensive to people. And just accept that. Just That's how it is. Don't try to mellow it down, try to pretend that, yeah, my, my kind of Christianity is not offensive. My kind of Christianity can blend with anyone. No, <laughs> that's not biblical. That's not biblical at all. So Christianity claim is exclusive in that everyone, without exception, apart from Jesus, is dead. So second point is, what killed you then? What made you dead if you're not in Jesus? Three things Paul says here in verse uh, one, two, three. The first thing is that caused you to die is follow because you follow the course of this world. See the word following? There's a few following there. The second following is you follow the prince of the power of the air, Satan. So you follow the world, you follow Satan, and the third thing is you follow the passions of your flesh. We're dead because of these three things that we do, that we follow. So let me quickly explain the three following. The first one, you follow the course of this world. Well, what do we follow? Many things we follow in this world. You may think that you're not following this age or the culture that you live in, but everyone is influenced by the culture. Even the best of Christians to their best ability still, still follow the culture of his time. Many great Christians in the history You can find flaws in them. And when you look deep at their flaw, why they are such a, for example, racist, even though they're so good in any other way from a 
biblical perspective is because the way he's raised is in his day is acceptable to everyone. It's acceptable in the culture. In a way, he's shaped by the culture. He follow the culture. And because of that, we need grace. Otherwise, we're dead. So that's the first thing. And how, in, how do we, you, follow the culture of our days, follow this world? Well, what's big these days is freedom, self-expression, self-centeredness. Um, our society today equates freedom to, to something to mean that you can do whatever you want to do, to be allowed to do whatever you want to do. That's our society, how our society defines freedom. There's no limit. You can do whatever you want to do. That's freedom. Freedom says no one can tell me what is right or wrong for me. I define what is right or wrong for me. That's what our society defines, freedom. And if you're not careful, you follow this trend as well. You, you, you embrace this belief as well. I can be whatever I want to be. Let me say to you, no, you cannot be whatever you want to be. If you're Asian like me, you're 170 centimeters long, you cannot be an NBA player, I can tell you that. You cannot be whatever you want to be. See, our society tells us you can be whatever you want to be. No. Christian believes you can be whatever God wants you to be. Not whatever you want to be. You can be whatever God plans you to be. See, some of us are so indoctrinated by the culture of our, our, our society that we become um, people who discriminate against others because we think we get to where we are because of what we've done. Have you realized what you get to today is because of things that it's outside your control? For example, you're born in a family that you're born in. <laughs> you didn't have a say. You don't have a say. You didn't have a choice for your parents or even the country that you're born in. That's outside your control. That's outside your control. And your parents will determine, uh, will shape in a way a lot who you are today. Where you are born will shape a lot and determine a lot what you become today. If you're born in a totally different parents, in a different country, in a different socioeconomy, you might not be who you are today. There's a lot of factors in our life that we have no control of that have shaped us today. So you don't have the freedom yet that the culture tells us you have freedom. You can be whatever you want to be. Even, even uh, there, there's authors that have, um, researchers that have delved deep into these issues of um, people who are extremely successful in their life. And when they research about their life, there's always things, one or two things, sometimes even more, that they found in this successful person that could not have done if those things didn't happen in that person. He wouldn't have been that successful if there's these circumstances didn't happen in his life or her life. That is outside his control. So is there a coincidence when you see it from that point of view? Yes. Yes. So the kind of freedom that our society tells us that you have, that we have, is actually slavery from the Bible's point of view. Because you've been led to believe without knowing that you don't have a choice. That you don't have a choice. You are only as good as, they say, your obedience and conformity to the standard that the society has defined you. Why? In the world, people want to look certain way. Where do you want to look certain way? Who do you think make you want to look certain way? That's not you. That's a society defining what is acceptable. 
Why do we dress? Why do we behave the way we behave? A lot of them because of society say that's acceptable. And you think that's freedom? No, that's not freedom. That's just following the trend, the culture, the society. You think it's freedom, but it's actually slavery because you have no say in it. You just follow it. So self-centeredness in our life is the manifestation, in a way, of freedom as defined by our society today. It's slavery and it will lead you to death. That's what Paul says. That's the first thing. We're following the course of this world. A lot of us, not knowingly, does that. Second thing, we follow the prince of the power of the air, the devil, Satan himself. See, following the prince of the power of the air, uh, who is devil, it's devil, you follow him, you'll, you'll be dead, right? So that's obvious in a way if you're a Christian. But how? How do we follow the devil? See, you follow the devil. It says, described here, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's how it described the, the, prince, the, power, the prince of the power of the air. So we follow the prince of the power of the air or Satan or devil. How? When we live in a life of rebellion and disobedience of God's law. When we disobey God, when we disobey God's law, what God says, we have followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's what Paul says. So that's why many people today live in, you know, in this spirit of disobedience. Children growing up, you don't have to teach them to be disobedient to their parents or to authority. They just grow up in that way. Deep inside, you don't have to teach children to lie. They learn to lie themselves. So Satan, the father of lies, is very good at one thing, that is to lie and to deceive. That's what Satan or devil's specialty, they're special, specialized in lying and deceiving. They, they are the master of it. So another way that we can kill ourselves is when we believe in the devil's lies and rebels against God. <clears throat> this is what happened in, in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve choose to not believe God, to disobey God and believe Satan. They disobey God because they believe Satan. When we follow the prince of the power of the air or Satan, is when we disobey and disbelieve what God says and we follow Satan's lies and we believe in Satan's lies. The third thing Paul says is when we follow the passions of our flesh. This is, I hope this is the most obvious because finally... <clears throat> it is somehow, it's your decision to follow your passion, right? This, this idea of freedom. I just want, want to follow my passion. I want to follow my heart. How many times we heard that, right? Just, just follow your heart. Listen to your heart. When the Bible says clearly that our heart is deceitful above everything else, above all, our heart is the most deceitful thing. When you follow the passions of your flesh, when you follow your heart, when you follow your instinct, that will lead you to death. See, that's another kind of slavery. When you follow the passion of flesh, it's another expression of self-centeredness. That's the opposite of following God. See, what, let me ask this. Why do most people want to be happy? Why do most people... Um, you know, or why do most people seem to be happy even though they're dead on the inside? They think they're living the life, you know, that the best life that the world has to offer them. Why do you think that is? It's because they have bought into these lies that Satan gives them. See, your friends, your families, your colleagues, if they're not in Christ, when they're smiling, when they're happy, you know there's nothing for them to be happy about. There's nothing in them that's worth smiling about because they're dead. But why they do that? Because they have bought in and believe in these lies that Satan had gave them. So you have believed this lie or Satan's lie when you say <clears throat> this, I don't need God in my life. I know what to do with my life. 
I'm, 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 I'm okay on my own. Or, um, you know, I can define how I, ought to my, I, how I ought to live my life. When you believe that, you have, bu- you have bought into the lies of Satan. You have acted like Adam and Eve in the garden. When Satan say, did God say that? Really? Nah, that can't be right. It's okay. It's all right. See, it can be convincing when they say, it's okay. You know, it's just small, small things. It's fine. When you read the Bible, say, that can't be right. Right? It's okay, isn't it? When you start to compromise, you have start to believe in the lies of Satan. You have followed the passions of your flesh. <clears throat> now, do you hear yourself talking to you, speaking to you, these little lies, this little compromise? They will grow. They will grow. They will grow to a point that you realize how self-centered that is. That is all centered, all those lies that you choose to believe is because it makes you happy. You think it makes you happy. It feeds into your flesh, your self-centeredness, because it feels good. No, one, see, no one's seen if it is bad for them, if they know it's bad for them. No one, no one, will, no one will sin. So Satan lies is this, it's okay, it's good for you. And we believe that. And before you know it, you've been enslaved by it. You cannot get out of it. You want more of it. You, want, you crave more of it. Whatever that is, whether that's success in your life, approval from someone that you love, that you care about, whatever it is, you want more of it. You crave more of it. It's never enough. When it comes to Satan lies, you always want more and you grow deeper and deeper into it. And you, one day you'll find out that you cannot get out of it anymore. The third thing is you are made alive. Aren't you glad Paul didn't leave us with verse 1 to 3 and say you were dead and bye? No, he he started in verse 4. This is the most beautiful verse. Uh, Verse 4 to 7 and then 8 to 9. It's just getting better and better. Verse 4 says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I don't want you to miss this. After he say you are dead, and this is why you are dead, you're following Satan, you're following the world, you're following the passions of your flesh, he said this, but God. It doesn't say, but Ferdy realized the wrong that he has done, and he turned to God. He didn't say that. He didn't say, but Ferdy finally realized how stupid he was. He said, no. Paul is consistent. He said, you were dead. You cannot realize anything. So if you can be made alive, it's because someone outside of you did something. And Paul said, but God, reach in his mercy. Why? Because of the great love in which he loved you. Even when you were dead in your trespass, made you alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You hearing this? None of these talk about what you've done or the step that you take to be in Christ, to be a Christian. See, some people think to be a Christian, they need to do something. Paul says no. To be Christian, God did something. That's how Christianity is so different to other religions or spirituality because other religions and spirituality have these requirements. You want to become this? You want to become like us? You have to do this. You have to follow this. Perhaps then you'll be good enough to receive all the blessings that our religion, our spirituality promises. Christianity says, no, but God. Not you, 
Not me, but God. Ferdy was dead, and dead people cannot realize anything. Dead people cannot do nothing. So as much as we, you and I want to take credit for being a Christian, for being a quote-unquote good Christian, because there's no such thing as good Christian, let me say that again. If you think there's such thing as good Christian, then you don't understand Christianity. Uh, good Christians, basically an oxymoron, does not exist, right? Uh, it's like say he's an honest thief. There's no such thing. Because Paul says you are dead, and not because you realize you become good, some like a light bulb comes on above your head, and they say, Ah, oh, I need God. No, it's it, but God. It's God Himself being rich in His mercy. So how you made a life. See, this is, this is another thing, how we want to take credit. We say become Christian. How you become Christian? Faith. I need faith. You're not safe. You're not good enough. You need more faith, brother. That's not what Paul says. There's no amount of faith can save you. We think to be a Christian, we need faith. But Paul says you need God's grace, not faith. How you made a life? Alive, people say by faith. But Paul says that's that's not entirely true. Let, let's look at that. I, I didn't make this up, okay, by the way. Let's, let's read verse 8 and 9. For by grace, this is the bit that you should, if, if you memorize two verses in Ephesians, this is the two. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So when you say, I'm saved by faith, you are taking credit for your salvation. That's not what that verse says. You say, I have faith, that's why I'm a Christian. That's not what that verse says. Um, when you say that, you become arrogant. You feel like you're better than those who have not faith in Jesus. Because you take credit for your Christianity, for your salvation. You say, I have faith, that's why I'm a Christian. He doesn't have faith, he's not Christian, he's not saved, he's dead. You're better in a way that because you have faith. But Paul says you have been saved, for by grace you have been saved through faith. What saves you is the grace of God. What is grace of God? But God. That is the grace of God, rich in His mercy. Not but Ferdy, not but John, not but Susan, not but Aaron. No, it's but God. That is grace. God taking the responsibility, taking the initiative. That's Christianity. Not us taking the initiative, but God taking the initiative. We are saved by grace. Without grace, we will not have faith. Faith comes because God has grace in us. But God rich in His mercy that we are saved by grace. I think Paul knows that you and I need more than just a statement that you have been saved by grace through faith. He knows that. He knows our self-centeredness. He knows that we as human beings love to take credit. And I think that is why Paul spells it out so clearly here. He doesn't have to, but he did. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That should be enough. But because we are self-centered, we like to take credit. Paul finds himself the need to explain to us further. He says this, you know what that means, brother and sister? That means it's not your own doing. That's what he said. He doesn't have to say by grace means it's not your own doing. He already explained, but God in his mercy did that. But he finds himself the need to explain. It's not your own doing. We think that's enough? No, Paul said, it is a gift. Not your own doing, it's a gift. If it's your own doing, it's not a gift. It's salary, it's wages, it's what you earn. Gift. Is something that given to you, not something that you earn. They say it's not your undoing. They say it's a gift. And what else? Not a result of works. How many times you have to repeat the same thing? Not your undoing. It is the gift, not a result of works. And they say, so that you cannot boast. He cannot be clearer than this. And that is Christianity, and that is the gospel. The gospel is simply the good news of salvation that by grace alone God saved us through faith. It's not our own doing. 
not a result of works. It is a gift so that we cannot boast. We cannot say, I have faith. If you would, have, if you just, you would have faith, you can be safe. No. We cannot take credit. So what does this mean? What does this mean? It means everyone, anyone can be made alive. Anyone. See, when you look at your friends, your family, your parents, your kids, they say, it, it takes a miracle. It will need God, biggest miracle to change that person's life from where he is now to be a Christian. Well, yes. How do you think you become a Christian? It's God's miracle. You think you're so good that you don't need God's biggest miracle to make a dead person like you and me to be alive today? See, it's our arrogance that we think, I'm such a good person. Of course, God can save me. But him? He needs God's miracle. All of us need God's miracle. See, that's the beauty of Christianity, I, I, I believe, is that not only that Christianity is exclusive in its claim, that not all roads lead to Rome, only Jesus re- leads to the Father, but it's also inclusive. Not only it's exclusive, it's also inclusive. Everyone can be saved. Certain religion, certain spirituality needs you to be a certain age because of their rules, because of the things that you have to do. Kids cannot do it, right? Children cannot do a lot of things that other religions or spirituality requires. Or people with disability or mental disability because they cannot think, they cannot do that, they cannot be safe. But Christianity is inclusive. Everyone can be safe. Why? Even if you cannot talk, even if you have severe mental illness, even if you cannot hear, even if you cannot see, even if you cannot read, the Bible says everyone can be saved. Why? Because but God. It's not but Ferdy. It's not but Aaron. It's not but John. Or, it has nothing to do with us. It is God who takes the initiative. It's God who takes the initiative. It's all inclusive. Everyone, regardless of your age, your socioeconomy, your ability, your education, you can be safe. You can be made alive. That's how inclusive Christianity is. There's no discrimination there. Because I don't really say, do this and that. <laughs> if, if you have disabilities, say, duh, how am I going to do that? Some religions say, you got to give this much to the society or to the, to the poor. But you say, I'm poor. How can I be safe then? I need help myself. And that is the gospel. The gospel is God take the initiative. The good news is, but God reach in his mercy, not us. So let me just quickly, so Paul has talked about sin and he talks about grace. Sin, the focus of sin is self-centered. The focus of grace is God-centered. Sin is putting yourself in the place of God. Grace is God reaching his mercy, putting himself in the place of sinful men. That's grace. We don't deserve it, but God reach in his mercy, put himself, who is holy, in the place of man, who is sinful and rebellious. So apart from Jesus, regardless of how hard you try, you will never be satisfied in your life. You will continually be running from one thing to another. And that's never enough. Because you're following your self-centeredness. You're following the lies, listening to the lies of Satan. You will chase the quote-unquote trophy of life that the society, whether your parents, your kids, your spouse, whatever, placed upon you. You will continually chasing that. You say to yourself, I need to be slim. I need to have six-pack. I need to have good career. I need to have a spouse. I need to have a nice house. I need, I need, I need, and I need. Where do you think that comes from? That comes from the lies of Satan. When Jesus came, he didn't tell you what you need to do. When Jesus came, he do 
what he came. He, he came to do what you and I cannot do ourselves. Other gurus came and tell you what to do. Jesus came and do what you cannot do for yourself. That is to bring ourselves back to life. What Jesus gives us today is not just good life, good health, good family, all that are great things, but ultimately he came to give you life. So on that cross, Jesus didn't tell us what we needed. He gave us what we needed the most. See, other religion can tell you, you need this, go and get it. This is how you can get it. Jesus said, no. Let me give you what you cannot get yourself. So what's the result of that? How do we ought, how we should do with that? And that's the rest of Ephesians, really. Now Paul has established who you are in Jesus, your identity as a Christian, and how we were before we are in Christ in the beginning of chapter 2. From here on, he tells us what does it mean to be a Christian, how we ought to live our life as a church, as a Christian. And he started in verse 10. I'm going to just close with that. Verse 10 says this, For we are God's workmanship. Who you are today has nothing to do with you but, but God, right? You are not your workmanship, but His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which what God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So all the obedience that we will listen to Paul from here on for the next 10 sermons or 9 sermons till next year is the overflowing of this, of who we are in Jesus. Not to gain what we think we, if I do this, then I'll be a good Christian. No, because he has established it clearly now. So remember, okay, the next nine sermons, when, when you hear Paul says, you ought to do this. You're a Christian. You're a church. You've got to love one another. You say, I do that because I'm a Christian. I have secured my identity in Jesus. I'm now alive. I'm loved before even I do any of that. So don't forget who you are. It's not because of you. It's because of what Christ has done for you. Let us pray.